Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Alazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we will go a bit in the science fiction because we'll talk about artificial intelligence with our guests today. So we'll talk about uh, uh, software that are helping some uh, doctors, some physicists to detect some disease. And uh, here with me, we have Leon Durn from uh, IDANCE. Uh, Leon is uh, the regulatory compliance manager in IDANCE and he's helping us to uh, understand uh, how uh, IDANCE um, got CE certified under EU MDR. So Leon, welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Thank you, thank you. Uh, nice to be here and uh, very interesting to be in your uh, podcast. Thank you. So, uh, Leon, uh, as I've said, so mainly we'll try to understand more about how uh, an artificial intelligence software can get uh, UMDR certified. Uh, but before that, can you make an introduction of yourself? So who you are and uh, what you are doing and also maybe a bit of IDANCE uh, software, what, what it is exactly? Yeah, of course. So uh, I started a long time ago to uh, study for a nurse. I finished my nursing studies and I quickly decided I did not want to work as a nurse because uh, to be honest uh, in practice I wasn't uh, able to respond quick enough to large emergencies that came in into the hospital and I deci decided that actually research and uh, science was much more of my interest so I decided to continue my studies I studied health sciences at the university in Amsterdam, in Amsterdam. and then after I finalized my studies I also had no idea at that stage what I wanted to do I got approached by a company but I was interested to come and work for them as their uh, office manager. And I decided to go for it, which was for QSurf at the time, which is a small quality and regulatory consulting firm. I worked with them for seven years doing just consulting. And I, then I decided I actually wanted to move over into the industry, decided to go and work for a larger medical device manufacturer, worked there for a total of four years, and then uh, decided that such a large company was also not the kind of company I wanted to work for. And... I really wanted to switch to a much smaller company with innovative products and joined Aidens. At that time, Aidens was still with a team of 10 people, so relatively small. And now we're, uh, we've grown to about 40 people. So we're growing. Yeah. So uh, mainly, mainly uh, so you are located in Amsterdam. Is Aidens also located in Amsterdam? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. We're actually, we're located right across from the Amstel Hotel here in Amsterdam. Many people will know it. It's a beautiful location and you're going to the office uh, when it's possible. Unfortunately, right now it's a little bit limited, but I hope that will be possible soon again. I can imagine. Um, yeah. So uh, in terms of uh, IDEN, so mainly, as we've said, uh, it's a software company that is mainly doing uh, software for, uh, for medical devices. Um, so we said also it's, uh, using artificial intelligence. So um, I just want to ask maybe first, what is, I mean, for people that uh, uh, don't really uh, understand that, so what is exactly artificial intelligence for, for this kind of software? And uh, is this something that, like we were kids, maybe we thought about those robots that will replace humans. So is it exactly the same thing that is happening now with those type of softwares? It's a good question. So maybe I should start a little bit on what, uh, artificial intelligence actually is because there's I think in the market there's a lot of misperceptions on how AI is and can be used first uh, we need to go to the concept of artificial intelligence if you look at traditional software it's all programmed by people so that means that people are considering uh, they have a specific task they want to solve it software and they start coding the software to resolve that specific task that is not always as effective as it can be. So there, for some applications, that's perfectly fine and it works really well. For other applications, it's a bit more difficult, especially when there's when the answer is not going to be black and white, but it's going to be somewhere in the middle and there needs to be a decision made. So what you do is you take a lot of data uh, that you gain, for example, images from the medical field, and you feed that all those images, all the data into the algorithm and algorithm will decide on the basis of, or will actually train on the basis of that data and will start understanding where the border between certain issues is. So if you look at the lungs, for example, if you see an abnormality within lung, it's uh, an, uh, some tissue might be an abnormality, some tissue might not be an abnormality, but where's exactly that border? That's very difficult. It's even difficult for us as humans to clearly see that. So what you do is you 
take a lot of data where humans, radiologists, experts in the field have decided this is an abnormality and this is non-abnormality. You feed that data into the algorithm and the algorithm actually starts to learn and understand what is an abnormality and what is not an abnormality. So if you compare that to traditional data, it's not hard-coded, it's trained on the basis of large sets of data. So that's oh. mainly the big difference. So it's, it's like having a child and, and teaching him what is, how looks a car, how looks a, a plane or how looks things. So you have to show him the image and maybe exactly. show him many times and then to say, and then he has to say, this is a car, this is not a car or, or whatever. Exactly. So is this something that, um, if I can say, stops learning at one time or it's always learning even after it's released? Yeah, it's a great question. So at some point, uh, this is uh, a decision that you can make as a manufacturer. So some systems will continue to learn in practice if you will set it up that way. However, if we look at the regulatory environment that we have nowadays, uh, that is actually a bit difficult because the regulations do not stipulate how such a continuous system would look like. So, and it, it can introduce difficulties. If you look at the market right now where we're at, with artificial intelligence, specifically in the healthcare sector, it's not the case. So uh, how these algorithms work is you train them, then you validate them against a completely independent data set and you see what the performance of your algorithm is. Then you, uh, you sort of freeze the algorithm and that's actually what you bring to market. So in practice, what you can do is you can gain additional information, you can gain additional data, and you can retrain the algorithm in the background, it, and then you test it again against your validation data, and you see whether the performance improves or uh, does not improve. And if it does improve, you can freeze it again and then release that in a similar fashion as the release of the first device as the second updated device onto the market. So in practice, that means that an algorithm can continue to develop and it can become better, but it's not that it's learning from the data that's being fed into it from the clinical practice. It can work that way, but today it does not. Okay, so I think it's interesting because maybe there is some people that think that um, even a software, an artificial intelligence software that was released on the market, uh, if I can say it's continuing to learn, so to change its algorithm yeah. and to change its decision, but it's not the case actually. So in reality, the artificial intelligence part is just on the development of the software, but when it's released, there is no more artificial intelligence working. Is it correct? So the, the algorithm that's included within the device is still based on artificial intelligence. So if you, if you would compare a algorithm that's released that's developed by AI or whether it's developed by standard coding, is that with standard coding, you know exactly what the algorithm is doing and why it's making certain decisions because you have checks and balances that are all computed by humans, whereas in artificial intelligence algorithms, you do not know. So you've trained it to make certain decisions, but we do not know why it's exactly making those decisions. The only thing you know is that it is basing its decisions on the input that you've provided into it. So if you have all these images analyzed by intelligent and highly expert um, medical physicians in the field, you know that the algorithm will learn from the best and then you know that the algorithm will probably mimic the performance of those best radiologists. So this is really a black box. So it's something that you yeah. put something in, uh, at the input and you get something at the output. And here what you are measuring is really that this output is always uh, correct and uh, performant and safe for, for the patient then. Exactly. So, but the black box, even though the inside of the algorithm might be a black box, you can test it, right? You can see against an independent data set how well it performs. You can see how it performs if you compare it to human performance. So you are able to test the performance of that algorithm, which is super important because it will show whether it's performing uh, just as good as radiologists in the field, whether it's uh, not as good as radiologists in the field or might even be better than the radiologists that are nowadays in the field or other kind of physicians because I'm here talking and referring to image recognition but there might be other types of artificial intelligence as well of course. Yeah and um, this technology is starting to, to grow we have a lot of companies that are starting yeah. to use that uh, but in, uh, in the previous ages, if I can say, when the regulation was in place, this was not really mature enough. So um, what is 
Now, the difference uh, in terms of, for example, of classification for this type of software, uh, when it was MDD and when it is with the new MDR actually. So maybe we should start by saying that under the MDD, software in general can be classified from class one to class three. And this is how, uh, depending on how you uh, interpret the rules and the type of software that you are producing. If you look at the, um, at AI solutions specifically under the MDD, uh, there is a number of companies, there are a number of companies that have classified these kind of products as two, two A products. There's also companies that have classified it as class one products. The, uh, even though I think we can all understand there's quite a bit of risk involved with devices that will support clinical decision-making. If you look at why this is done and if you go back into the regulation is that when the first classification rule was set up under the MDD, it didn't take software specifically into consideration. That's I think one aspect. And the other aspect is that the rule as set out in the MDD leaves a little bit room of interpretation and it goes uh, into specific need out of the top of my head for making a diagnosis, which if not the case, then it, the rule wouldn't apply and you would just fall under other and you would go back to a class one product. So one example that's given by the, by the European Commission, I think in the borderline manual, is that a device to, as an example, uh, to um, analyze lesions of the skin to determine whether that could be actually a, a melanoma, yes or no, yeah. would, uh, would be classified as a class one product, oh. which is quite tricky because this can be used by a layperson in their own environment that would use an application that would check whether a skin abnormality would be uh, cancerous or not. And if they receive the feedback that it's not cancerous, they probably will not go to a doctor because they assume that it's good. But then what if the algorithm makes a mistake and it turns out that it isn't actually a proper decision, uh, the consequence could be quite severe that someone goes, uh, thinks that that is not an issue to go for the doctor with and actually the cancer would develop and will become more uh, malignant and maybe less treatable as well. And so that's something where I think, and I personally believe that the risk of these kind of devices warrant that such devices should not be a class one device. And we can say that the, the idea, uh, if to just to remind to people, so class one devices are self-certified. So there is no notified bodies looking at that. Nobody's really looking at that. Only when there is maybe a, a major issue or a big complaints on it. So there is a, the member state that can go and look at, uh, at the company that made this device, yeah. but it's self-certified. So it means that there is no real proof that the, all the tests were done correctly to, to check uh, that this software is really detecting a melanoma or not. And this is yeah. the, the issue here in this kind of, uh, of device that we call low risk device because they are class one. Yeah, exactly. And it might not necessarily be a problem, right? Because for a class one device, it's not necessarily true that you have to do less, that you uh, do not have to validate your device performance. The only difference is, is the way that it's being controlled. Exactly. So that means that if you have a class one device, you can self-certify, which means there's no external body that's going to look at your complete technical documentation unless there's an explicit need for it. Whereas with a class two A device or higher, you will have a notified body that checks all the documentation. So if you look at actually at the MDR and what's changing is that I think the European Commission has recognized that there can actually be a potential risk with these kind of devices. And... Uh, that the software classification wasn't properly covered under the MDD. And that's why they introduced new rule 11, which is specific to medical device software. And that rule has changed the layout of uh, the classification. And in my belief, it says that all diagnostic and therapeutic software that uh, provides information that can be used by a, a physician to come to a medical diagnosis or uh, which could lead to any uh, either to serious well either to uh, minor injury or to serious injury or even death should always be classified as class 2a or higher which means that this whole class one uh, group of devices that now can exist under the mdd will stop existing and will all need to go through a notified body 
So um, I think it's something that is important just to recognize that the MDR uh, is taking into account all those new technologies uh, and yeah. then uh, really look at all the, the, the possibilities that they, they can do now that they couldn't really do before when the legislation was in place and that they recognize that, yeah, there is higher risk on, on this kind of, uh, of devices. And there is, as you mentioned, a specific rule now under MDR just for software, just to review yep. Uh, the software uh, software devices. Um, just to precision, so uh, as we said about uh, your device at IDEN, so uh, it's um, it's using artificial intelligence, but um, do you need still the help of a physicist of, uh, or it's something that you just put in a kind of a scanner, you get the information and you just have the letter sent to the, the client to say, you have this disease yeah. or that disease. So is there a kind of an automatic system to that or you still need the- yeah. So indeed, oh, coming back to your question, because I think your question was first, can AI replace the doctors in the fields, right? Yeah. yeah because that's, the, that's often the perception that people have that AI will start, will do in the longer term. At this moment, it's absolutely not the case that AI will replace a doctor, for, especially if you look at our product. So what we do is the product is being trained. The product has a certain um, performance level to detect abnormalities within the lung. So we help a physician, a radiologist, to find those abnormalities. So if you look at a radiologist, maybe I should go at it from that perspective. They make very long shifts. They have to review for one single patient at least 300 images within the lungs that are the result of a CT scan. And they have to go through all these 300 patients to find the abnormalities, which is quite uh, quite a bit of work. And you can imagine that it's easy to miss a, a abnormality, especially when they're smaller, right? An abnormality is already something that can be of five millimeters in size, which is really small and hard to see for a radiologist. So I think... Uh, what the software can really do and can help with is to improve the performance of doctors in the field and to help physicians become better at what they're doing nowadays. So AI can be seen as something that's helping healthcare getting better, where there's a clear benefit to the patient, but also to the radiologist himself. Uh, you probably, if you would ask anyone, uh, do you feel comfortable with just one radiologist looking at your data or would you feel more comfortable if the radiologist is looking at your data together with the support of an additional program that also will help to identify abnormalities, then I guess that all everyone, all patients will say, yes, please have that second pair of eyes which are being offered by the software. So, it, and this is also the experience, I think, of the radiologists themselves. They really um, appreciate the help of a second pair of eyes such as that offered by our program. So on the short term, I do not believe that uh, AI is going to replace a doctor, but I do believe that AI will help the doctor to become better at their job. And it will also help the patient eventually get better outcomes. So uh, in the case, for example, somebody has the ID to say, uh, my device is 100% accurate. Uh, so then I don't need a physicist at all. So will this increase the um, classification of this product? So yeah, oh, it's a good question because right uh, uh, there's typically a trade-off between sensitivity and specificity, which means that if your product is 100% sensitive, that means that you will find all abnormalities, but it can also indicate um, a normal tissue as being an abnormality or the other way around, which uh, can be problematic. So it's still good to have a second pair of eyes to look at the data. If the algorithm would surpass human performance, so it wouldn't generate uh, false positives, for example, and it its sensitivity would be better than human performance, uh, it still doesn't mean that there's no need for an additional uh, radiologist in place. For example, our device detects abnormalities on the lungs, which are called pulmonary nodules. But on the lungs themselves, there's also other types of uh, abnormalities that our device does not detect because it's not trained to find those. So we can support in taking over certain small parts of their entire process, but the radiologist will still view the entire lungs to find if there's other abnormalities that our software does not detect because it's not trained to find those abnormalities. So, so 
in, in terms of in terms of uh, the, the 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 product itself, as we've said, so uh, the class of the product is increased now uh, due yep. to MDR in comparison to MDD. Uh, it's not something that is automatic. It means that you still need some people to to use that. Yep. Uh, so the physicist can still decide to ignore the uh, the exactly. advice, if I can say, from this software. Yep. So it's not like they are, it's mandatory. They have to go through that route. They are still there to make decisions and say, yes, it's, it is exactly. uh, a nodule or it is not a nodule, and then we can uh, move to the next uh, next patient yep. directly. So um, in terms of uh, uh, EUMDR, as you said, the classification is higher. Are also the expectation from the notified body uh, higher uh, in terms of uh, artificial intelligence software. So is it more difficult for uh, you because you were MDD certified so under uh, CE mark under MDD. Yep. So now you are uh, certified under MDR. So was it more difficult for you to be MDR certified? I actually think if you ask me honestly, I think that the classification of our device and the risk uh, profile associated with the use of our device is already quite um, under scrutiny with the notified body nowadays under the MDD because they feel it's a new kind of device. They really want to see the evidence, the clinical evidence, how do you validate this? And I think that if, if I compare personally the expectations from the notified body between class 2A and class 2B under the MDR, so previously under 2A under the MDD, there's not that big of a difference in how they review the documentation what I do believe is that there's a much higher emphasis on post-market data. So getting your post-market clinical data, how are you going to follow up? How are you going to make sure that when the device is launched onto the market, that it will actually remain safe? So how do you, where do you gather that data? And uh, this is something that we at Aidens have placed uh, also quite a bit of focus on to make sure that we get this post-market clinical follow-up data to make sure that we can demonstrate that our device trained on a large set of data and validated on another set of data also actually performs in clinical practice in the way that we promise that it will. Because uh, a validation data set, you try to create one that's as representative as possible for the clinical practice. But you only know once you put your device out in clinical practice, whether you've achieved that to do that job properly. So I think for AI devices specifically, but probably also for other software devices, the emphasis on post-market clinical follow-up is really important and also post-market data. So you need, if I can say, some, some data to prove that your device is doing uh, what you are claiming that it is doing. So um, for that, yeah. are you, where are you using some kind of clinical investigation uh, process or where are you more yeah. getting some data from centers and they provide that to you? So how, what was the methodology here to prove that your claims were correct? I think what's fun with, uh, with our type of device, right, is that it's quite new, it's innovative. People in radiology uh, are quite happy to work with these innovations and they're quite happy to investigate how it actually helps them in their work. So some of the hospitals that we work with they're really happy to investigate what the benefits are of our device in their practice. And they are happy to publish about it as well. So we have a number of hospitals that offered to start doing some studies with the use of our device. And we greatly uh, welcome that because it fits right in with our postmark clinical follow-up strategy. So we have, a, 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 which is, I think, very cool for us is that one of the hospitals is actually done a uh, study right now and they shown that the performance that we claim for our device is exactly matching the performance that they found in their clinical practice for our device which is just confirming that our device does what we say in our um, in our in our documentation so uh, the the uh, so you have all those data you are claiming all those things so you have yep. all those reports uh, I think at one point, as you mentioned, the notified bodies are reviewing that. Um, notified bodies were not, um, as, as with MDD, they were more class one devices under uh, as a software. So there were, I think, not a lot of experience for all notified bodies about a software study. So was there any kind of uh, need to have a specialist of uh, algorithm of AI uh, under the uh, notified body or... Yep. Was it a normal person, a normal auditor that was doing also orthopedics or whatever? 
No, so uh, at our Notify Body, they actually assigned a person. Well, our main reviewer was responsible for the review of all the regulatory documentation, but he wasn't uh, responsible for the re Well, he is ultimately responsible for the review of the clinical documentation, but our Notify Body does use external experts in the field to review our uh, clinical documentation. So they, uh, and they actually used, um, I think a radiologist from the field to review all our clinical documentation, which makes sense because a radiologist is also someone who's very interested in the kind of studies that are published around these devices. So they will know what, what, what is required to get these devices out on the market. Okay, so, so uh, yes. it's, it's really, so uh, you have here like a, a team of specialists that are reviewing everything yep. for clinical uh, software, uh, all the data here. So um, your notified body um, was your notified body for MDD and it is yep. your notified body for MDR. Yes. So how long did it take for you to make this transition from MDD yep. to MDR? What was really the struggle, if I can say the most important struggle on during that process? Very good question. So when we started, I think it's about uh, more than a year ago where we started the investigations during a gap assessment and finding out that actually the classification rule had changed. So when we looked at the classification rule, our first interpretation was that our device will be indeed a class, uh, could be varying between class 2A, class 2B and class 3. Uh, we had long discussions internally with the team on uh, which definitions we should follow. If you look strictly at the definition from the MDR, you could end up in class three. If you look at the definition from uh, the guidance document that was issued by the NDCG, you yeah. could end up with uh, class 2A or 2B. And then there's additionally a reference made to the software as a medical device document from IMDRF, which we also went through. And then we ended up coming to a, uh, classification of 2B. The very first thing that we did when we had that discussion, well, when we found out that there is interpretation to be made to this classification rules that we planned a meeting with our notified body and we went there and we presented our case to them and we asked them for their thoughts as well. So what we did is we, even long time before we started submitting, we already sent in our classification rationale and came to agreement with the notified body that our device was going to be class 2B. And that's also the moment where we started working on changing our quality system. We had a stage one audit in January uh, this year, and then we submitted the whole product documentation in the running of April. Then um, obviously, as you know, Corona uh, also started to become a real problem here in Europe. And that's where uh, our device was submitted to the external clinician. And that caused us quite a bit in, of delay in the review process because the radiologists were extremely busy with daily practice and getting um, corona under control and helping out with the corona situation. So that caused some delay in the review process and that made that the uh, review at the Notify Body took another six months for our product file. But uh, eventually, uh, end of September, we now actually in October, we received our MDR certificate for the product. So uh, the, the one year delay uh, due to Corona was yeah. also helping a bit here to, uh, to have it everything on time then. Exactly. So it, for us, it took from, I think from the moment from our first MDR audit, which was in January when we updated the quality system to, to date was about nine months. But if you also calculate in all the time that we spent on updating the documentation and getting the quality system in place and starting this discussion, on the classification rationale, it's easily a year or more just for one product, which so, is quite a long timeline. So if you had now to remember all your story about this certification, so what was the most challenging or the struggle, the biggest struggle that you had on this journey? You know, the biggest struggle was undoubtedly the uh, review period where we expected that we would have response much faster than what we did. But we understand why it took longer because of Corona. But the struggle is that when we decided to move over to the NDR, we submitted our product to, to the Notify Body for review. And during the entire review, we found out that a product that we had on the market also needed to be updated, but which was the product we submitted. And then we got quite stuck because there's a product out on the market uh, that we can't update because we don't have the new certificate yet. And then is where we decided that we're going to continue making updates to the product that was out on the market under the old regulation. But obviously, you can't introduce major design changes anymore because they would not be reviewed by the notified body. 
because you are, you're also working on your MDR application. Uh, so uh, yeah, we had to postpone actually making some changes to the product, which was a bit frustrating. Uh, but finally, and now that we do have our MDR certificate, we still can't go to the market because of this discrepancy between the device that we have on the market, which is more up to date than the device that we submitted back then to, to our notify body. Yeah. So, we need, so it's, it's a bit of silly because the device that we submitted is no longer state of the art. That's a product that we have on the market still on the MDD. So now we need to make changes to the MDR product to become state of the art again. So I can imagine that a lot of software company will go through that route and that yep. they will submit a software, but in the meantime, they will have to go to a new version because of maybe some changes that, yep. uh, that are happening and that uh, when they will be MDR, they will be stuck also and they will have to make an update of all the yep. things. So I think it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing. It's a good message, if I can say, just to, uh, to uh, inform those companies that this can happen and this is something that uh, most likely will happen just because of the uh, time, yep. the duration, for the review of all the, the technical documentation from yeah, uh, and it will happen for sure. No, it's it's a it's a great story. So really, thank you for for that. Um, so IDENS, as we said, so is uh, providing this type of software for hospitals. So um, who I mean, who here is re will be really interested to use this type of software? So our software, right? It detects pulmonary nodules on uh, lung CT scans. So the main a uh, person who is reviewing lung CT scans is the radiologist. So the benefit is directly to the radiologist and eventually also obviously the patient. But uh, the, our users are really the radiologists in the field. So um, when we are saying radiologists, so mainly it's uh, all the people that, uh, I mean, it's really used on uh, real patients. So is it a, a yeah. real life, I can say a, a live uh, experience that you will have for the radiologist or it's something like they have first to take the scan then they will have to go to a, another computer and to check yeah. the things or, or it's uh, directly coming from for, on real life for, for them so that's a very good question if you look at our software it's a direct uh, integration into their existing workflow and it offers as little interaction as uh, as they they would well, say differently. So if you're a radiologist, you really don't want your whole workflow to get disturbed. You want the actions you need to do as a radiologist to get the outcomes to be as minimal as possible. So it doesn't, so that it actually provides time efficiency, right? You don't want to go through another uh, long uh, program where you have to click a lot of things. So what we do is we integrate uh, directly into their workflow. We obtain the scan. The scan is automatically being processed. The results are immediately being sent back to the to the PAC system of the hospital. So that means that when the radiologist goes into the system, he will see the data that he usually reviews for the patient, but then additionally, immediately the results that we've generated. So that all, um, and he, he just goes through his normal results as he always does, but then can decide to uh, also look at our results at the same time within the same system without having to go through other separate systems. Okay, so I think uh, I think it's really something that is uh, important also for, uh, as you've said, to not disturb the workflow and that uh, exactly. people are getting really the the information directly and can move forward. As you as exactly. you mentioned, they, they are looking at a lot of patients, so if they are reducing their productivity just because of uh, that, it can it can be maybe damaging uh, all the workflow. So great, uh, great, yeah. uh, great idea here. Um, okay, so Leon, really thank you for all the information. I think it, I will, I hope it will help some other uh, medical device uh, software company to understand the process uh, to get uh, UMDR certified. And again, congratulations for being that because I don't think there is a lot of companies that are uh, UMDR certified now. So it's really great to have uh, people that are following this process and that are uh, completing that. Um, okay, so. Now, uh, mainly where people can follow up with you. So is there some kind of, uh, are you on social media or it's more like website or how, how is it working? Well, everyone can, is obviously free to send me a message to LinkedIn or just go to our website. We uh, display all our full team of uh, data scientists, our software engineers and our medical and regulatory uh, persons as well in the company on our website uh, with images. They, everyone is free to click on my image and send me an email if they want. No, great. Looking so, forward to getting questions. 
Yeah, I, I will. Uh, anyway, yeah, I will. Uh, I will put uh, your details on the show notes so people uh, can go directly on the show notes and and uh, contact you. Uh, yeah, if they have some question, maybe for uh, artificial intelligence or maybe how to yep. pass a certain audit, so it could be great. Uh, so uh, yeah, I hope this will be really helping a lot of uh, companies uh, on doing that. Um, okay, so Leon, so really thank you for your help. Thank you for all the information uh, for all the people that are listening to this podcast. So please don't uh, hesitate to provide any message if you uh, have any question. I will uh, forward that to Leon. So if there is an, anything that he can uh, help you to answer. And uh, if you are listening to this podcast on your car or doing your workout, so don't hesitate to provide a review on your uh, podcast provider. And if you are looking at that on YouTube, so don't hesitate to put a like and also to provide some comments. I uh, will be really happy to, to answer to them. Okay, Leon. So really happy. Thank you for your help. Thank you for all the information. And I wish you a nice day. Okay. Thanks a lot. I wish you a nice day too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.